the Ancient Coin Club and is currently a member of the Board of Directors as well as being the current membership outreach chair and is responsible for organizing this event today and we thank him for that. He is the owner of Apollo Numismatics and I ask that you join me in congratulating him as tomorrow will mark the 10th anniversary of his company opening its metaphorical doors as a coin dealership. Uh, Merrill. And if I could have that microphone down here too, so that. Maybe <laughs> not. Okay, thank you, Ken. And thank you all for coming to our seminar. Uh, I'm going to be speaking to you today about the differences. Uh, and similarities uh, between ancient coin collecting and the collecting of U.S. and world coins. Some of the differences may surprise you, but before I can talk to you about differences and similarities, I need uh, to let you know what ancient coins are. The coins of three main civilizations comprise the bulk of the coins we call ancient. These three civilizations are ancient Greece, ancient Rome, and the Byzantine Empire. However, the coins of several other civilizations are regarded as important to ancient numismatists. The coins of ancient Judea, Achaemenid Persia, the ancient Celts, the Sasanian Empire, and the Parthian Empire, as well as other ancient societies are all regarded as ancient coins. Incidentally, the coins of the Parthian Empire supply most of the information we know about ancient Parthia, since the Parthians left no written records. The time period for ancient coins is from roughly 600 BC to 500 AD, with the exception of the Byzantine Empire. The Byzantine Empire lasted into the age of, ex of exploration, the mid-15th century. Even though the Byzantine Empire covered the medieval period, its coins are still regarded as ancient because of the empire's continuity with the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire was the largest coin issuing ancient civilization and a civilization uh, of intense interest to ancient collectors. It should be noted that although ancient coinage started in China at about the time it started in the West, here in the West the term ancient coins is not generally thought of to include Chinese or other coins of the Far East. Most ancient coin dealers and auctioneers in the West do not carry Far Eastern coins. Ancient coins were made of copper, bronze, brass, silver, gold, and electrum, which is a naturally occurring amalgam of silver and gold, I should say alloy. Potent, a leaded bronze, was also used for some ancient coins, primarily those of the ancient Celts in Europe. Ancient coins share one important attribute, they were all either hand struck or cast from molds. Typically, for struck coins, the obverse die was placed in an anvil. A cast flan blank was placed on the obverse die, and the reverse die was held against the flan. Someone then stru struck the reverse die with a hammer. Struck coins by far predominate over cast coins in terms of number. Now that I've given you a brief introduction to ancient coins, I'd like to tell you about the differences and similarities between collecting ancient coins and collecting U.S. and world coins. I'll start with the differences. Let me begin by describing what I think are some of the unique attractions of ancient coin collecting. Coins of many ancient coin types financed foundational events of the Western world and ancient coin collectors enjoy owning tangible collections, connections rather, to our civilization's roots. Here is a Persian gold derrick issued during the time of the battles of Marathon and Thermopylae. This silver tetradram, uh, let's see, oh yes, this silver tetradram financed uh, the dominance of Athens across the Greek world. 
This tetradram struck by Alexander the Great in Memphis, Egypt, during the, uh, was struck during, by Alexander the Great during the period of his conquests. And this silver denarius was issued by Julius Caesar's enemies during the period in which he was dealing the death blow to the Roman Republic and ushering in the imperial period. This tetradram was issued by Mark Antony and Cleopatra shortly before their award of the death with Octavian, who was later to be re referred to as Augustus or Caesar Augustus. This gold aureus of Hadrian was issued during the building of Hadrian's Wall in Britain. This silver Stavroton, issued by the last Byzantine Empire, supported the state during its dying days. Coins of religious significance also abound. This bronze pruta was issued by Pontius Pilate, and this pruta by Herod the Great. This phallus was issued by Constantine, the first Christian emperor of Rome. This silver shrekel is from the first Jewish war, which began in 66 AD, a war which included the battle for the hilltop fortress of Masada. This tetradram was, uh, was uh, issued by Antiochus IV, the Greek persecutor of the Jews in the second century BC. Ancient coin images tell vivid stories. Here, the traitorous woman Tarpeia is shown being crushed to death by Roman soldiers. This is a voting scene from the Roman Republic. On this coin, two warriors, one Roman and the other representing Rome's allies, stand facing each other, holding spears and touching with their swords a pig held by a figure kneeling between them a ritual used to cement alliances. On the obverse of the coin is the Roman god Janus. Here, a Roman soldier is shown carrying the head of a Celtic warrior. C complex images, such as this, in which the emperor Trajan is shown addressing his troops, troops also exist on ancient coins. Many ancient coins reveal attitudes motivations and in goals expressed without subtlety, or at least what we would today would call subtlety. Here, a conqueror of Judea, the Roman Emperor Titus, portrays himself standing triumphantly with the Jewess who is in an attitude of mourning. Here, the Roman Emperor Probus portrays himself trampling a bound captive. Figures from mythology are common on ancient coins. These include images of Hercules and the Nemean lion, man-headed bulls, mermen, hippocamps, and other fanciful beasts, gods, demigods, and spirits. Interesting animals, rhinos, monkeys, tuna fish, tortoises, at least one skate, and an enormous number of different style depictions of lions, eagles, and bulls also appear on ancient coins. Some coin collectors are primarily, primarily interested in the beauty of ancient coins. During the classical period in ancient Greece, cities competed with each other to produce beautiful coins. The coins they produced rival the best of modern sculpture and far surpass the beauty of modern coins due in part to the ultra-high relief possible with hand striking. Although the ancient Greeks produced the most attractive coins, almost all the ancient civilizations produced a number of beautiful coin types. Other ancient collectors are primarily interested in portraits, which vary greatly in quality on ancient coins. In addition to collecting ancient coins for beauty and for excellent portraits, other collecting options are available to ancient coin collectors that are not available to collectors of US and world coins. Some collectors collect the coins of specific cities that they have visited or find interesting for some other reason. Other collectors collect the coins of a specific person. There are a number of fascinating ancient historical figures I have not mentioned thus far. For instance, uh, 
Philip II of Macedon, father of Alexander the Great, whose conquests convulsed and fundamentally changed the Greek world. The fast friend and later mortal enemy of Julius Caesar, Caesar Pompey the Great, the Roman emperors Caligula, Nero, Marcus Aurelius, and many, many others. If you're interested in learning about history, you will likely find more support in the ancient coin co community than you will in the U.S. or world collecting communities. For example, in major coin auctions, each coin will have one and usually more reference citations to the exact places in standard scholarly references which deal with the exact uh, places in which, de which deal with the exact references uh, in these uh, publications to, to the exact type. Uh, for more important coins in an ancient coin auction, a blurb will often accompany the listing, describing the historical circumstances surrounding the issuance of the particular coin type. In addition to numerous scholarly coin reference books, numerous general history books are available to satisfi satisfy a collector's interest in the events that his or her coins have witnessed. When ancient coin org organizations such as our club get together, the focus is as much on history as it is on coins. Another factor in separating ancient coin collecting from U.S. collecting is the greatly increased number of ancient types compared to U.S. types. The time period during which ancient coins were issued was roughly ten times longer than the period of U.S. coinage. There were also a great many more ancient types struck per unit time period than U.S. types. The types minted changed much more frequently as well. In one particular year, there were four Roman emperors, each of these emperors issuing numerous coin types. Although I haven't done research to verify this, it appears to me that the number of coin types submitted by this one civilization, the Roman Empire, during this one year exceeded all U.S. regular uh, issued types uh, throughout the history of U.S. coinage. Put another way, there are plenty of people who can reel off at least close to all U.S. coin types in U.S. history. I could come close to doing this myself as an avid young collector. I don't know anyone, or with one possible exception, who could come close to reeling off all Roman Empire types issued during the year of the four emperors. And of course other ancient uh, civilizations were issuing coins during this year also. As I said in my introduction, some of the differences between ancient coin collecting and U.S. World, uh, and, US and world collecting may surprise you. Most U.S. and world collectors have been told since day one, don't clean your coins. When entering the ancient coin collecting world, these collectors sometimes find it hard to accept that all ancient coins have been cleaned. Ancient coins are found buried in the ground by themselves or in hoards. They have, on average, 2,000 years of exposure to the soil or corroding environmental inf infiltrations. With the exception of a few gold coins that need only washing with a toothbrush under running water, ancient coins all need either careful mechanical cleaning or chemical cleaning uh, to remove encrustation and corrosion products. The skill with which this is done, of course, is an important factor in their value. Also difficult to accept for brand new ancient coin collectors is the fact that coins with mint errors are almost always less valuable, not more valuable, than coins without errors. Because ancient coins were hand struck, imperfect strikes were the rule rather than the exception. Your 1955 double die penny might be worth much more than its unblemished cousin, but the coin in this photo is worth much, much less that it would be if it were well struck. New ancient coin collectors are surprised to learn that it is perfectly fine to handle ancient coins. Ancient coin surfaces are impervious to the kind of damage caused by skin acids that affect modern coins. I figure that I've seen well over a million ancient coins and photos of ancient coins in my years as a collector and dealer. In that time I've seen at most three ancient coins that I thought might possibly 
have had fingerprint marks, but these marks were most likely caused by natural fi uh, factors unrelated to fingerprints. An additional difference between ancient coin collectors and U.S. coin and world collectors is that a lot fewer ancient collect coin collectors are intensely concerned about the value of their coins. Many, many ancient collectors are just happy to have these remnants of the part of the ancient world that fascinates, fascinates them without much concern for their value. Nevertheless, a lot of collectors are interested in their value of their coins, and a lot of my remaining marks concern value. Another difference that new coin collectors, uh, new ancient coin collectors, sometimes have difficulty adjusting to is that rarity is less of a factor, often much less of a factor, in the monetary value of an ancient coin versus a U.S. coin. There are thousands of ancient issues where only a handful of coins of the type are known, yet they nevertheless, br nevertheless bring very low prices. One challenge that an ancient coin c collector faces that is not faced by U.S. collectors is that there is no red book type price guide or in fact any other value publication, regu regularly issued or not, uh, any other value guide publication. There are books published that list values associated with each type, but these values are taken with a grain of salt by most collectors and are at best only a very rough guide to relative values. One of the best ways for a new collector to learn what prices are reasonable for the coins he or she wishes to acquire is to join an ancient coin club such as ours. There he or she can ask the opinion of members who have had much experience with the ancient coin market. The new collector should also examine the prices realized by ancient coins in auctions and look at the prices asked by dealers who have a reputation for reasonable pricing. In discussing the uh, differences between ancient collecting and U.S. and wo world coin collecting, the last subject I want to talk about is encapsulated and graded coins, that is, coins and slabs. The first thing that one should note is that the slabbing companies that encapsulate coins do not provide an authenticity guarantee as they do with U.S. coins. I don't claim to have intimate knowledge of the business plans of coin slabbing companies, but my opinion is they don't provide authenticity guarantees because it would be too big a task to do accurately, given the resources they have available. As I have pointed out previously, there is tremendous diversity among ancient coins. There are multiple civilizations and multiple time periods within each civilization, each with its own distinctive characteristics and containing a huge number of types. Even identifying all coins within the, this diverse set is quite challenging, and the slabbing, slabbing companies occasionally fail at it a fact I personally have benefited from two or three times, having picked up valuable coins that had been misidentified. However, the real challenge for the slabbing companies comes in catching counterfeit or altered coins from across this broad spectrum. As well as the coins being diverse, the counterfeiters who try to fake them are diverse too. Some of the counterfeiters who specialize in Roman Republican coins, for example, uh, use different techniques than some Parthian coin counterfeiters. In my observation, the slabbing companies do a particularly bad job when it comes to detecting altered coins. I have seen several uh, altered coins in slabs, a fact that I have verified by finding photos of the same coins before they were slabbed. The photos clearly show that the coin ha coins had blemishes, such as large scratches, which had been doctored subsequently to eliminate the blemishes. In sum, I don't believe the slabbing companies think they can both identify and authenticate the broad spectrum of ancient coins without losing their shirts, either in insurance claims or alternately the cost of hiring separate experts in all the specializations that are required. Another thing that you should keep in mind is that these slab coins are only acceptable in the U.S. The major market for ancient coins is in Europe, not the U.S. I have never seen a slab coin in a major European auction. You can look in vain through the thousands of coins in the auction catalogs of NAC or Tikalik or Gornian Marsh or Lance for a slab coin. 
I don't believe you will find one. Another problem with, ancient, with slabbed ancients is that you can't touch the coins. I like the feeling of holding in my hand a coin issued by Julius Caesar, Caesar, knowing it likely passed through the hands of a soldier in one of his legions, and then through the hands of many other Roman soldiers, shopkeepers, etc., before reaching my hand. Direct access to the coin has very practical benefits as well. Being able to touch the coin is necessary to inspect for some forms of false patination and is helpful in detecting some counterfeits. The little tabs that cover portions of the edges of the coin can hide flaws. If I owned a slab coin and, and was considering removing it so that I could sell it in a European auction, I would worry about what I would find under one, under one of those four slabs. It might be an unpleasant surprise and for a high-end coin, a costly one. The weight of the coin is given on the tag that is encapsulated with the coin. However, the weight can't be checked. The weight of a coin is often a critical factor in determining authenticity or the presence of certain conditions like clipping. An error in weighing, which I for one find easy to make when I weigh coins, can wrongly condemn or exonerate a coin. The last thing I have to say about ancients and slab is, and slabs is, don't take the grade that is shown on the slab seriously. In my experience, the typical grade on an ancient slab is about one to one and a half grade levels higher than it should be. In ancients especially, you should follow the adage, buy the coin, not the slab. If you would like lear to learn how to grade ancient coins, my suggestion is that you follow the guidelines on Doug Smith's webpage. His grading page has a lot of photos and is very helpful. Doug is an avid collector and is not affiliated with any commercial interest. Just Google Doug Smith Ancient Coins. The first listing that comes up is usually a link to the Doug's page. It's kind of a busy page and you need to go down the page past 10 other links before uh, you get to the grading ancient coin links. Now that I've discussed the differences between ancient collecting and U.S. and world collecting, I'd like to tell you about the similarities. First of all, as far as the, as the value of your coins go, quality is still paramount. The definition of quality is somewhat different though. While amount of wear is still very important, factors like centering, flan size, evenness of strike, quality of the metal and quality of the flan enter the picture in an important way. However, the general rule is still the same. There is a steep value curve, particularly at the upper end of the spectrum. Another thing that will seem familiar is that there is a large market for ancient coins. Although the majority of this market is located in Europe, as I've mentioned, there are plenty of U.S. ancient coin dealers and auctioneers too. Counterfeiting is also a very big problem with ancient coins, and you'll want to stick close to a knowledgeable dealer until you feel comfortable with your ability to detect the vast majority of counterfeits on your own. As with U.S. and world coin markets, alterations are definitely not acceptable. However, there is one called, process called smoothing that I want to discuss. It is done by smoothing out the patina on areas of surfaces that were intended by the ancients to be smooth. Smoothing has been practiced since the Renaissance and has gained acceptance by most ancient coin collectors. This smoothing is acceptable only to the patina though, never to the metal, and only on bronze or brass coins. No such thing is ever acceptable on silver or gold coins. No alterations of the metal under any circumstances on any coin is acceptable. Also, any alteration to the patina that alters the details of the image, such as strengthening the borders of the device to make a coin look sharper, uh, is similarly unacceptable. Finally, one thing that the new ancient collector will find familiar is that there are many different price levels to the ancient coin market. One can acquire some ancient coins very inexpensively for a few dollars. One can even acquire very nice specimens of some common coin types rather cheaply, under $50.
On the other hand, if one wants to pursue the most sought after ancient coins, one will not have any problems spending high six figure sums to acquire them. So thank you for your attention today. And now I'm going to turn things back over to Ken. Merrill, thank you for your well-considered uh, thoughts on this core topic, and also thank you again for all your hard work in orga organizing and coordinating today's presentations. Um